My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Once again, welcome to the podcast, Joxana Corona. I'm hoping that you can start us off today by telling us your very compelling fire story and introducing yourself to the audience. Well, hello everyone. My name is Joxana Corona. Um, on September 8, um, 2020, I lost my home in the Almeida fire in Southern Oregon. Um, it's been almost nine months actually. And it's just, it feels like long ago, but yet it feels like yesterday. It's kind of like an oxymoron, really. It's, I can't believe how long ago it's been. And, and nine months is not too long, but it still feels like a long time ago. And yet it feels like it just happened. Yeah. Um, September 8th was just, Labor, it was Labor Day weekend, really. My family and I had gone to the coast on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and had come back um, sun, Monday night, actually. Um, we unpacked because we got home late from the coast and Tuesday, my husband went back to work. It was my day off on Tuesday, but um, my kids were, it was the beginning of the week for them for their new school year. They were supposed to start school that same week. And um, when we got home from the coast, it was super windy. I remember we were in Crescent City when I realized that there was a red flag warning stating that um, there was gonna be a high fire potential and strong winds, which were gonna be, um, I think 50 miles per hour winds, which were uncommon in Southern Oregon. That's why there was a big red flag warning. And I remember being at the coast in our hotel and I saw that red flag warning and it had the map of Oregon and it pretty much the whole state of Oregon was in red flag warning. There was not a place where you could safely go and not be in the red flag warning zone. And I remember instinctively thinking, oh, this is kind of scary. I've never seen a red flag warning all in Oregon. And I mentioned to my husband, should we stay here in the coast like an extra night? Because I just, I was scared and I just had a bad feeling about it. But even in the coast, it was still a red flag warning. So my husband said, no, we're just gonna go home. I have to go to work tomorrow, meaning him. So we did, we drove back home. And um, as soon as we got home, the winds were super strong. And our mobile home park had big, huge trees. I mean, the people knew telemobile estates by the trees. Many of the community knew which tell them which mobile home park I lived in just by the trees. If I ever said, oh, I lived in telemobile estate, they, they'd say, oh my gosh, the mobile home park with all those beautiful trees. So I always was concerned that a strong wind would knock down a branch on our tree or a whole tree. I lived there 17 years and I have known um, families who had a whole tree fall on their roof. Um, luckily there has never been any um, injuries to people. It's just been a lot of damage to those, those roofs. Um, one of those people was my mother-in-law. She lost a whole tree fell on her house about three or four years ago. And when we got home, it was really windy. So I actually slept in the living room because um, the wind was so strong and the, our bedroom was, the tree's right next to our bedroom. And I told my husband, oh my gosh, this, if this tree falls, it's gonna crush us. So we gotta go sleep in the living room. So we did. And before, before midnight, actually a big branch fell on our roof and it woke us up. My husband went to check it out and there was a big branch like barely hanging on our, it was on our roof, but it was on, but it was like kind of hanging off. Um, it didn't fall on the floor. It was just literally on our roof. So the next morning, my husband said, well, you know, I've secured it. I made sure that it's not going to fall on you guys because my daughter wanted to play outside. My daughter spent that morning playing outside with our neighbors. We know all our neighbors by name, pretty much all the Catalan Mobile Estates community um, was an actual community. We knew, our, we knew everybody there. Uh, my daughter has a friend who like, she's literally two weeks older than her. We, her and her, her mom and I were pregnant at the same time with both with my young daughter and with my son. I mean, we have kids the same age and the community was like a big family. So my daughter was playing outside with, with her friend and her friend's cousins. And they were just talking about the wind, how like it was so windy and um, we were fostering kittens and that's why they had to come over because they wanted to see the kittens. We are like known as the crazy cat family because there's always cats or kittens in our house that we're fostering. Um, 
So after they saw the kittens, they were playing outside and the wind was really strong. So I actually had a short video of my daughter playing outside and the wind was super strong. You can, my video shows the trees like way going. And my daughter's hair was like straight at a, a angles. I don't know what angles, 90 degrees angles. It was just like this. <laughs> it was pretty much flat, like horizontal because it was so strong, the wind. And my video shows the roof, the, uh, um, a cardboard metal roof just swinging because of the wind. And about 20 minutes later, I got a text from Ashland alert saying that there was a fire in Ashland and it gave a street, but I didn't know the, the streets. Um, I was lucky that I was signed up for the Ashland fire, not fire alerts, but just emergency alerts because I was a student at SOU at Southern Oregon University and I had an on-campus job. So I was pretty much always in Ashland. So I was signed up for the Ashland alerts and I graduated in June of 2020 and completely forgot about the alerts that I had signed up for. So I never unregistered for those alerts. So in September, when the fire started in Ashland, there was an alert sent out to people who were signed up for those Ashland alerts. And I happened to be one of those people. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, um, there's a fire in Ashland. Okay. I looked at the street and it didn't look familiar. So I didn't think it was, I, re I really didn't have a clue of where it was. Um, but then within a minute or two, I got a second text stating that Ashton um, residents should be alert and um, evacuations were in progress for certain streets. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, that's like less than a minute a part of a text. So I went outside, my daughter was still playing outside and I happened to look across the street and one of two of my neighbors were outside looking towards Ashland. It was a mother daughter um, and an older mother daughter, the mom's in her maybe seventies, the daughter's in her fifties. And they were both looking towards Ashland. And I looked at them from their porch, from my porch, I look across to their porch and they pointed out like, oh, there's smoke coming from over there. And we could hear the sirens because we live pretty close to Highway 99. We can hear the, the sirens of the firefighters and police. So I told them, oh, there's a fire in Ashland. Um, and I told them, I just got a text and I know that Ashland is evacuating. So as I was walking my way towards them, because I was kind of talking to them as I was walking towards them, I looked towards the direction of where they were looking and I could see the smoke and they looked way too close. I told them, oh, um, I mentioned the street from the text and they didn't know where that was, but I told them, oh gosh, that smoke looks way too close. So then um, I got onto Facebook and I started seeing if there was any information and I could see posts from friends who live in Ashland, friends who are still currently school, um, who at that time were still students at SOU. Um, there was a lot of information from friends going on on Facebook, but nothing by um, police department or like the city of Talent or city of Ashland. There was no information on their behalf, but pretty much I went by um, information provided by friends in the community. So I told my daughter, you know what? We're going to get out of here. And I told my neighbors, um, you guys need to get out of here because it just doesn't look good. Um, the wind was still blowing really strong. And I told them, wow, like that fire is going to reach us quick because of this wind. So I called my husband because I don't drive. So I called my husband to, and told him that there was a fire in Ashland and he needed to come get us. And he, he worked about 20 minutes apart from, from our home. So he said, okay, I'll be right there. Um, well, in the meantime, me and my daughter were going door to door, knocking on our neighbor's doors, letting them know that there was a fire because by this time it was about 11.30 a.m. Um, and it was the first week of school. Many parents were at work. It was a weekday. It was a work day. So many parents were at work. I knew that many of our neighbors, their kids were home alone. So I had um, me and my daughter were going door to door, knocking on our neighbor's doors, letting them know that there was a fire and that we were going to evacuate and we were encouraging them to evacuate. And then my son, I told him, hey, text your friends, you know, like the ones that, you know, are home alone, let them know that, you know, they should let their parents know to come get them. So my daughter and my son were texting their friends via like Snapchat and Instagram and whatever social media that kids use because they check their social media more than they check their texts. <laughs> so, I mean, my son's 16 and my daughter's 13. So it's a good thing that they know about social media and were quick to alert their friends. So I, I immediately put a Facebook post with a picture. I took a picture of the smoke, what it looked like from Telemobile Estates. And I put, out, put it out there like, I even made a public post. Usually my Facebook is private, 
Um, but I made my post public and I posted, hey, the fire national is really close. If you live in Tallinn, evacuate now. And I posted, we're evacuating, please evacuate as well. And I posted a picture of what I could see from my home from Tallinn Mobile Estates. And um, I put, please share and like, just share it and share it as much as you can. And I know that like people, it, it reached people in Portland. I had a friend tell me that she lived in Portland and she saw my post being sent. Like, so she said that she, you know, living in Portland, called her family and friends who lived in Phoenix and Talent. And, and that's how like a lot of, you know, it was just a momentum of you got to use what we have. You know, social media is, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It's good and it's bad. But in, in this case, like I know that a lot of the information was shared over and over by social media. And I know my posts went everywhere. So we ended up evacuating within, by 12 o'clock, my husband had made it home. And he said that he initially thought that I was kind of just exaggerating, but he could hear my concern in my voice. So he said that he, you know, he, he just decided to leave work and come check it out. He said that as he drove from Medford to Talent, he initially couldn't see the smoke, but then as he made it to Phoenix, he could see the smoke. And as he made it to Talent, he could see the traffic jam, just people evacuating Ashland were heading north and he could see the traffic just getting bad. And he was going south because he was trying to get home to us. So as soon as he made it home, um, me and my daughter were still outside knocking on doors and looking for our cats because we had, um, we have pets and our cats are indoor, outdoor. So my son, my husband, as soon as he pulled into um, our row on Telemobile Estates, like we kind of made eye contact and just a look in his face, I knew it was bad. So my daughter was still, you know, knocking on doors. So I kind of followed him to our driveway because he was driving. Um, he was driving slow enough where I was just walking behind the car and he told me, you got to go now. So I told him, okay. So he we called for my daughter. We're like, okay, Abby, come on, let's go. And I went inside and my, my son had already gotten all our dogs on their leashes and had gotten the few cats that were indoors into um, their crates and he was ready with them. It didn't even occur to us to pack. We were too concerned to let our neighbors know and trying to get our cats that we didn't even take anything. We just had what we were wearing, our shoes, and that's it. Um, we didn't take a single thing with us other than my, our cats, our dogs. Um, we even took our neighbor's dog who was out of town. She had gone to California and she was paying my kids to like um, watch, the, watch her dog and feed her and you know give her water and take, her on walk, take him on walks. So my son was like, oh, we got to take the dog too. You know, we're not going to leave him. Obviously we weren't. So we ended up leaving with like an extra dog, our two dogs, four cats. And just, I remember my daughter didn't want to go because we still were missing some of our cats. And my husband said, get in the car. We can't wait for more. We can't, you know, they're just going to have to fend for themselves. And my daughter had like a little plastic pool, you know, just a summer pool. So my daughter got ran, got the hose, the water hose and started filling up her water pool. I mean, there was still water in it, but she decided to fill it up to the top and just let it run. And she asked, asked oh, I still remember, she looked at me and said, well, if the fire gets close, our babies can jump in the car, in the, the pool, you know, referring to our cats. And I just remember thinking, oh God, like, that's so sweet, but I don't think the little pool is going to do anything. But I didn't tell her that. She was just like, mommy, they're going to jump in the, they can just jump in the pool. If the fire gets here, they'll jump in the pool. And I remember telling her, okay, that's what, that's what they'll do. It's a good thing you left the water running, sweetie. So we got in the car and we left at about 12.05. And it was just chaos. There was traffic. There was, it was bumper to bumper. We could literally walk. If we would have gotten off the car, we would have been moving faster. And I mean, this was 12.05. The fire hadn't reached Talon, but it was a, less than a mile away. And the traffic was really bad, especially from people coming from Ashland, the freeway had been closed by that time. It moved so fast. I know that by the time we, like we were on Valley View Road, which is half a mile away from our house. By the time we were there, we were hearing on the police scanner that the fire had jumped the freeway and it was already coming towards us. And um, just a few days before that fire, before the Almeda fire, I don't even remember where there was a fire. Um, I don't know if it was California, somewhere there was a fire where it moved fast. And some families were evacuated via helicopter. I don't remember where I, I can't remember where I saw it. I mean, I saw it on Facebook or something, but I can't remember the location of that fire. And I remember I was watching that on my computer and I didn't realize that my daughter was watching the video as well. Um, but she told me later that the day of the fire when the traffic had stopped completely, 
she thought that um, the same thing was going to happen to us. She said that she th she could picture helicopters coming to get us, which she never told me that moment. But a few, I want to say a couple months later, she told me that, that she thought that the same thing was going to happen to us. We were going to be trapped and helicopters were going to have to come get us. Um, eventually, it took us an hour to get um, out of there and make it to Medford, which is where my husband's cousin lives. And the fire eventually, like, it was so windy, there was fire starting everywhere. And I know that there, there's a lot of people out there who are saying that these were fire, this fire was deliberately started and that, you know, the fire was started by many people. It was an organized thing. I don't believe that. I generally don't believe that. I know how windy that day was. I know how the ambers work. I just don't believe that happened, but I don't believe that it was purposely said. Like, it, I don't believe it was an organized event. Like, no, it was just a bad, a lot of bad elements worked together that day to make it the way it became. Um, but we happened to be in Medford. Um, we were there all day and by six or seven o'clock uh, a fire started literally across the street from where we were. And we could actually see the flames that were way bigger than the house behind us. And um, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like in the morning when we left Talent, we could see smoke and I knew that the fire was less than a mile away, but there was still like, like that half a mile gap between us and the fire. But when we were, when we had to evacuate the second time on that evening, the fire was literally across the street. We can see the flames and everything. We had to spend the whole day at my husband's cousin's house and um, their neighbors across the street happened to, my, we knew them because my husband used to play soccer for many years. And um, the guy across the street used to be the goalie for the same team where my husband played for many years. So we actually, you know, greeted him when he got home from work and, and he's like, oh, you guys live in talent, right? I'm like, yeah. It's like, is your home gone? Like, we don't know. We were just kind of talking across the street. He had just come home from work. And I remember, you know, him, him um, telling us, oh, you know, wish you guys the best. Where's your mom? Talking about referring to my mother-in-law. And at that time, um, probably one of the, like, the whole situation sucked. Because my mother-in-law was working the day of the fire. She had actually been... Um, quarantine due to COVID. She tested positive for COVID in early August and she got really sick. She missed almost a month worth of work. Um, and that day, the day of the fire was her first day back to work after being off for a month. So um, she tried to get home when she heard about the fire. She tried to get home. She called us. We had already evacuated and my husband told her, do not go home. But yet she still went home. She didn't want to not go home. So she made it home. Um, and wasn't able to take anything. The fire had already, I don't know if she made it all the way home, but I know that she couldn't get anything. Um, as she was trying to leave Talent to meet us at um, his, her niece's house, the fire in Phoenix started. So she ended up um, having to turn around. The police department told her that she needed to turn around because the fire had started in, in Phoenix and it was really bad. So she ended up having being stuck between the fire in Talent and the fire in Phoenix okay. and her phone died. And I remember the last time we talked to her, she was like telling us goodbye because she didn't think she was gonna make it out. She was scared, she didn't speak English. She just was going by like what people were doing, you know, turning around, she knew cops were telling people to turn around and she had no way of understanding what was going on. She knew, she knew that there was a fire in Phoenix and she was stuck between both of them. There was no going north because the fire in Phoenix was preventing people to go north and she couldn't really go south because the fire and talent was keeping her from going south. So she was literally there for hours. Um, she says that she heard explosions for a couple hours and she said that she literally thought she was gonna die. When we finally saw her that evening, she made it to my husband's cousin's house and she wasn't even there five minutes, literally. Um, when we, when me and my husband were talking to Junior, who's the neighbor across the street, you know, he's like, how's your mom? And we're like, well, you know, she was stuck, but she's made it out. We, we've made contact with her. A uh, good, uh, somebody who was in, who was in the, her vicinity, like let her borrow her, fo their phone charger. So she was able to charge her phone enough to make, for her to make that call and let us know that she was safe. Because the last time we spoke to her, she pretty much told us she was stuck between both fires and she didn't know she, if she was going to make it out. So for two hours, we had zero communication with her, knowing that she was stuck between both fires. 
um, but we were trying to make the best of it. You know, we, we didn't tell the kids what was going on. We, they just kept asking about grandma. Did grandma make it home? Because the last time they heard grandma talk to us on the phone, we were still in the car and it was speaker because of Bluetooth. And my husband told her, don't go home. But she's like, no, 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 I got to go home. So my kids knew that grandma was going home. And they kept asking us, did she make it home? Where is grandma? But we didn't tell them that she was stuck between both fires until she did call. And I think um, we knew the severity of it. And I didn't want to, I didn't, if that was the last time she was going to talk to us, I wanted her to say goodbye to the kids. So we did have my kids, we did tell the kids that, she was stuck between both fires and they were concerned, but it, it would have sucked if she wouldn't have made it out and we would have kept our kids from saying goodbye. So we had to make the decision to let them know what was going on. And when she made it home, she got off the car and she was shaking. Her hands were shaking. She started sobbing. It was a relief to see her, but she was so broken. Really nice. She was absolutely shaking. And that's when we went inside the house and then we're like, okay, Junior, see you. You know, we're gonna be with my mother-in-law. And we weren't even inside five minutes when suddenly we started hearing screams, get out, get out, get out. Um, which happened to be um, Alan, who's um, my, my cousin's husband. Well, Alma, Alma's the house where we went to. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Alan, started screaming, get out, get out, get out. And he's a Marine. I mean, he went to, Afghanistan a couple of times like he does not panic but I knew the way he was screaming to get out get out get out he meant it so I, I, I was in the kitchen talking to my mother-in-law sitting down with her when we started hearing screams get out get out get out so I ran to the front and I could see the flames across the street and Junior who I had just been talking to two minutes ago um, I could see him carrying two kids one on each side and his wife carrying the baby like just getting in the van you know because the fire was right behind their house um, so we evacuated there really quickly. My mother-in-law was shaking, but we had to go. Um, we went to Grand Pass where a friend of mine told us, just come over here and, you know, we'll spend the night here. But by then it was me, my, I mean, it was a caravan of people. It was me, uh, my husband, my kids, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law and his wife and their three kids. I mean, there was a lot of us and we had four cats, my two dogs. My mother-in-law had her dog who she managed to be able to save. Um, so it was, it was a lot of people, but my friend said, just come on, we'll figure it out. You all lay in the carpet in the living room, but we'll figure it out. So we tried to sleep through the night, but we took shifts. Um, my husband and his brother were taking shifts, listening to the police scanner, trying to figure out you know, where that fire was moving. Um, and then when we, I did get some sleep, um, my daughter and I, slept in the spare bedroom. Nobody wanted to take the bedroom. I was like, fine, I'll take the bedroom. <laughs> Me and my daughter will take it. Um, and my daughter, oh, it really sucked. She literally cried herself to sleep. She kept saying, kept calling the names of the cats that we had left behind. And she kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry we left you. She named them one by one. She was so sure they were gone. She was sure they had perished and she just kept sobbing especially because some of her friends were like messaging, messaging her through Snapchat. The families who like stayed behind because they thought that there was going to be a warning or help when there really wasn't. Um, people, again, the double-edged sword of social media. Like if I would have realized how much stuff my daughter was seeing because of her friends sending her pictures, I would have taken their phones. My daughter knew our house was gone because one of her friends texted her and told her, your house is gone, it burned. And that's how my daughter found out. Um, then the next day, people were able to go into talent and they were sending her pictures of burnt cats thinking, hey, is this one of your cats? I mean, I know there was like good intent, but gosh, it sucked. Even um, the day after the fire, I posted pictures of our missing cats. I said, hey, if anybody finds these cats near talent mobile estates or near Arnold's Road, please let us know. So people all of, were always tagging me every time there was a burnt cat. So my daughter pretty much um, cried herself to sleep that night, calling out our cat's name, saying she was so sorry. And it was, it really sucked. I told her, sweetie, you know, they're smart. You know, they got away, I'm sure of it. But in my heart, I was sure they were gone as well, but I was just consoling her. 
and she got maybe three or four hours of sleep. I got two hours of sleep, I think. And then um, when we woke up in the morning, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my husband were up and they said, hey, there's fires around. There's one in the coast, which is not too far from here. There's one, there was fires everywhere. Like we were literally surrounded by fires. So my husband said, we can't stay here. We are just gonna be stuck here if another fire hits. Cause my friend lived in Grants Pass, but in rural Grants Pass, so it was more like forest. And I was like, yeah, no, we're not staying here. Like we made it out tonight, but we gotta go back. So we went back to Central Point. We were there all day with my brother-in-law who, lived, who at that time lived in an apartment. And he's like, well, you guys can all stay here. But he lived in an apartment and we had four cats. We had our two dogs, plus my neighbor's dog, plus my mother-in-law's dog. And we're like, no, you're so going to get kicked out of here because he lived like on uh, low income housing. Mm -hmm. So um, like they have to have, they can't, they're not even allowed to have pets themselves. So, so I told him, you can't, we can't stay here. We'll stay here during the day, but we'll figure it out. We'll go to a hotel or something. And my husband was like, what hotel is going to take us with all of these pets? So I thought, well, yeah. So I made a post on Facebook asking for if anybody was willing to um, foster our pets. And my daughter was like, no, we can't give them up. We can't. We just, she said, one of the things that I always remember is um, her persistence to keep all of them, to keep all our pets, because she said, we lost everything. We have nothing. The only thing we saved were our pets and we can't just give them up now. And this was the day after the fire. My sister, my daughter immediately was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to lose them. We lost everything, you know? So people started offering to shelter our cats. We had four at that time, four were missing and then our two dogs. So people did offer to, to foster our cats separately, not together because <laughs> there's a lot of pets. Um, but eventually, eventually, um, a friend of mine reached out and said, just come on over to my house. I'll, you know, it doesn't matter. Bring them all, bring all the pets. And she had two cats for herself. And I was like, well, cats are mean to new cats. And she's like, don't worry about it. We'll just figure it out. So we went to her house and she lives actually less than a mile away from where the fire started. She lived on Hershey and the fire had started just down the street. She said that when the fire started, um, she evacuated herself, but the, the wind turned and it, you know, had the wind been the other way, like her house would have been gone. But the wind just turned the other way and her house was fair. She literally lived, like you could walk to where the fire started. Um, and my husband said that actually that was a safe place to be because if the fire started again, there was nothing to burn. Like all the fuel, everything that had burned would keep the fire from reaching us again. So we did, we were there. Um, we went there Wednesday night because in Central Point, after leaving Grants Pass, we went to Center Point to my brother-in-law's house where we were trying to figure out what we were going to do before we could actually figure out what we were going to do. Another fire started at Center Point and we could actually see it. My husband is actually one of the people who called 911 because we were like, there's some smoke over there. We looked and next thing you know, there was a fire. So my husband called, called 911 and he didn't want to tell the kids, but at this point I'm like, no, we need to be on full alert. Get the kids in the car, let's go. Um, so yeah, we evacuated a third time. So we evacuated Talent in the morning on Tuesday. We evacuated, evacuated Medford the evening on Tuesday. Then we left Grants Pass in the morning because in the morning of Wednesday, because there was too many fires around us, not close enough where we needed to evacuate it, evacuate, but we weren't gonna wait for that either. Yeah. So then we ended up pretty much evacuating four times, four times in a 24 hour period. But the fourth time we ended up going to Ashland where my husband said we would be the safest because the fire had started there and there was no fuel for it to, to burn again. And we were there pretty much Wednesday night through Saturday, through Sunday morning, because on Friday night, um, we ended up having um, the Girl Scout Center reach out to me. Um, they called me saying that um, they were aware of our situation. My daughter's a Girl Scout. She has been for nine years since she was in kindergarten and she's in, going into eighth grade now. So this will be her eighth year in, in Girl Scouts. And both my husband and I have been involved with Girl Scouts. I'm a camp leader. My husband does food sales with the girls, not just our daughter, but like the troop. So we've done, we've been pretty involved since my daughter was in Girl Scouts since kindergarten. So now you've been evacuated several times. You end up back in Ashland. And for those who don't know the Almeida fire, it was started in Ashland on the Greenway. And then it whipped up the Greenway, which turns out are the really efficient um, carriers of wildfires. 
Um, and a lot of the fires that she's that uh, that you are referring to um, have to do with ember cast fires. Uh, embers can go up to five miles ahead. There, it's terrible for the listeners who are not familiar with how the dynamics of mega fire. Very difficult to manage. Um, so then the Girl Scouts, which you have, which you have a long history of, they reach out to you and take the story from there. Yeah, they reached out to me on Friday, letting us know that they were aware that two registered Girl Scouts had lost their home. Um, and one of them, um, they had like an RV, so they were kind of set and they had homeowners insurance, so they didn't feel the, that they needed the support from Girl Scouts. So they asked them, they said that they wanted to reach out to us, finding, wanting to know if we needed shelter and they would offer us shelter. They actually offered us shelter they said anywhere you want to go, any of our Girl Scout facilities because of COVID, everything's locked down and closed. They were so supportive. They were like, if you want to go to the coast, we have a facility in the coast. If you want to go camping in the woods, we have a facility in the woods. And I said, no, I have a job and so does my husband and we can't just take off. So they said, oh, how about the Medford Girl Scout Center? And I said, yeah, we can do that. And the Medford Girl Scout Center is, um, there's a Medford Girl Scout store right next to it. There's the the Medford Girl Scout Center is almost like a small community center for Girl Scouts. There's a small kitchen, there's like the um, stall bathrooms, and then there's like the big open space. It's equivalent to about a small gym. So that's, I knew what they were talking about when they said the Medford Girl Scout Center. I had been there many times hosting events for our troop or helping out with, um, with community-led events. So, um, so I told them, yeah, that'll work. But then she said, okay, so it's just you guys, you four, right? And I said, no, it's actually us four and my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. And I mean, they know us, so they knew they were a family of four. So they said, okay, so what, like, how, how did you go from a family of four to a family of six? And I told them that my um, mother-in-law and sister-in-law also lost their home because they lived in telemobile estates as well. Um, and she said, well, I got to talk to our supervisor because we are offering shelter to um, the Girl Scout family, which consists of us four. I told them if we can't have my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, we can't accept the shelter. We're not going to be like, see ya, good luck. Mm -hmm. So they called me within an hour and said, that's fine, that they would offer shelter to us six. But um, because of COVID and everything, they, they made, you know, pretty, they made it pretty clear that they would only be offering shelter to us six. We weren't, we, they couldn't offer shelter for more people because of quarantine. We would be considered a quarantine area. So now my dogs are doing it. Hey. Stop it. You're so cute. Okay, you, you can keep this in, Ling. It's fine. It's all because she's doing a good job. So I apologize for my dogs now entering into the recording for those of you. So, you know, and that's actually a really important point that, you know, how you had to navigate your, your megafire also included this whole other comorbidity of COVID. And so a lot of the strategies that we, had, we would typically advise or use or implement during a disaster were not even available to uh, most people. And so, so you move in with your family then to the Medford Girl Scout Center and shout out to Girl Scouts, by the way. Yes. And how long were you there? We were initially told, oh, okay, you guys can stay here two weeks. And then, you know, in two weeks, you'll have your things figured out and, you know, go, go ahead and um, move out but you know two weeks later there we were still looking for housing because it's hard to find something somewhere to move into when you have that many pets <laughs> okay so you are two weeks uh you're two weeks in and one of the things that happens in all disaster areas especially with wildfires is there it's not like and in wind and rain often people can go back to their homes and sort of make do um, while they go through a remediation process um, if the home isn't totally gone but in mega fires, it's everything is gone. Like everything is just gone. It's like a bomb went off. And so housing is at a not at a premium, and also in an area that was already, um, you know, had a very tight housing market. In some parts, very expensive, um, and very importantly, in Talent in Phoenix, which were most affected by the Alameda fire, it held a huge amount of the workforce, and the workforce has to go to work the next week. And so there aren't, I really appreciate the fact that you included that part in your story that you didn't have the luxury of being able to just go to a different part of the state and hole up for a couple of months while you figured everything out. So anyway, it's all great points and very important. So you are staying there 
And um, and so talk, so you've managed to find a place to be and that's that's wonderful. Um, talk to us about the process of, you've since moved um, to Central Point or talk to us about what it was like to go back and see your home. And, and Lang, edit that out, what I'm saying right here in direction. And then you can get to the point of how many people you knew were displaced and the issue with trying to navigate this system with FEMA. Yeah, I knew from the beginning, pretty much, I think from the, the day after the fire, once I, I was in Ashland and I felt a little bit safe, once we got the call from Girl Scouts letting us know that they'd offer us shelter for two weeks, to me, two weeks was like outstanding. To me, two weeks was like, oh my God, we, we don't have to worry where we're we gonna go tomorrow. But immediately after getting that call, I knew that there were so many other families who didn't know what they were gonna do tomorrow. So there was this heaviness of like relief, but at the same time, guilt. There was this guilt that I didn't have to worry where my kids were gonna be at in the next two weeks, because I knew that many of my families didn't have that luxury. And I feel that I am privileged to be able to um, be a volunteer at Girl Scouts. I feel like I am privileged to have been PTA president at my school or at my kids' school. I have done a lot of community advocacy work as a volunteer, but that even being a volunteer is a privilege that people don't realize. Many of my communities, like you said, were in the workforce. They were working in the fields, working in the orchards, working in restaurants, working in um, hotels, in the hospi hospitality business. You know, um, there's, and then I'm, I'm undocumented. I grew up undocumented. I was born in Mexico. So for many years, I couldn't work. So, I mean, I'm not someone who likes to play the victim role. So I couldn't work because I was undocumented. So I volunteered a lot. I did a lot of volunteer work because I wasn't going to sit at home and do nothing and cry because I'm undocumented. That's just not who I am. Um, so I guess being undocumented did allow me the opportunity to do a lot of advocacy work and volunteer work. And it that volunteer work led many doors to be opened up for me. I got to get involved with a lot of community advocacy work. And after the fire, many of the agencies that I had volunteered for in the past reached out to me asking, what do I need? What resources do I need? And I pretty much used that outlet to remind people that, you know, there are many, I'm not the only undocumented person here. I'm just one of many people. I'm one who's open about my legal status. So many families are not open about their legal status. One thing that allowed me to be open about my legal status is the fact that my husband is, um, is a US citizen. Um, so I'm, we're technically a mixed status family. My husband is a US citizen. If my advocacy work, my um, being open about my lack of legal status got me deported, then I know that my kids still have a dad who's legally able to stay in the United States and I don't have to worry about what happens if both of us get deported. So that's a privilege that I have. And I use that privilege. I am open about my legal status. And yes, I have DACA, but a lot of people don't realize that DACA is just a work permit. Does not grant me legal status, does not grant me anything but the ability to legally work in the United States. Yes, I have a social security that I, and I can work for um, legally work, which I'm, pretty, you know, fortunate that once I got DACA, I was able to go to college, paid for it completely out of pocket because I was not eligible for FAFSA. I couldn't get financial aid or anything like that. I paid for school out of pocket. And I did a lot of advocacy work for undocumented students as well throughout my education. I, I got to attend um, different conferences where I got to educate people about the obstacles that undocumented students face here in Oregon and in the nation. So I mean, I use, again, my privilege because education is a privilege. Being able to volunteer is a privilege. Being able to do social work is a privilege. It's a lot of work, but it really is a privilege. And people think that, oh, no, the, all these hippies are just doing all this thing because they want to. No, it's a privilege. It really is. Um, so I, I use the privileges that I've been granted, you know, and I use that as, as a platform to speak for those who don't have those privileges. My mom didn't have that privilege. My mom being undocumented, she had to work hard to raise her two daughters. She didn't have a partner. Uh, my dad pretty much was never in the picture. Um, only when he needed stuff, he'd show up and be like, I want to be a family. And then he'd like take off. So um, well, one of the things that when I when I met you um, and you were talking about, I, I was really moved by when you discussed the concept of home and what your home meant to you. You know, and if you could briefly tell our um, our, our audience 
that, you know, in this area of workforce housing, yet 18 mobile home parks were destroyed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, your, your home had, a, it had 100 units in it and 93 out of hundred, I believe were not, um, insured. And, and at the same time, many people were of mixed status. So if you could give us an idea, just, if you could let the audience know your story of how you found your home and, and that it meant so much to you. And you also used your home as a beginning place for where you've done all this volunteer work where you've completely contributed to your community in really meaningful and impactful ways. Yeah, my husband and I moved to Talent Mobile Estates in 2003. Um, my husband and I, we we're both immigrants. Yes, my husband is a US citizen, but he was born in Guadalajara, Mexico, and I was born in Puebla, Mexico. Um, both him and I actually came to the United States in 1989. But he came to Oregon and I came, I went to California. My, that's where my mom settled. Um, his dad was in the process of becoming a legal resident. So after many, many years, 20 years almost, it took him to become a legal resident. That's when he was able to apply for Carlos to become a, a citizen um, because Carlos was still a minor when my father-in-law became a US citizen. So that is how my husband got legal status. I didn't have that opportunity. My mom came here undocumented. So my mom didn't have an established status. Therefore, she couldn't apply for status for me and my sister. So we've pretty much grown up undocumented, you know, but we both are immigrants. Both my husband and I, he's, a, he's only two years older than me. So he came to the US when he was six, I was four. And he does remember life in Mexico. Um, when he became a resident, his illegal resident, his parents went to Mexico and when he was 18 years old. So he remembers going to Mexico and seeing his grandparents and the life that he left 12 years earlier. Um, I've never had that opportunity to go back to Mexico. But for us, it was very important as parents, as undocumented, as, as immigrants and as kids, um, ch children of immigrants, it was very important for our kids to have a stable home. Mm -hmm. Because in LA, I mean, I remember bits and bits, bits and bits small pieces of Mexico, but I don't actually remember life in Mexico. I remember just small things. Then I moved to California and Southern, Southern California where due to legal status and just a lot of stuff, my mom always moved. My, I, I can't even count the, the amount of times I've moved as a kid. So when I moved to Oregon and I met my husband, it was very important that my kids never had to move so many times. Cause even my husband in Mexico, he had a set place. Then they moved to Southern California for, for just a short while, then they moved to Oregon, and in Oregon, they settled in Talent, then they moved to Phoenix, then they moved to Central Point, and then my husband and I moved to Talent. So he's moved a few times, less than five times, but still he has moved often. So for us, it was very important that my kids never had to move. So when we purchased our house in Telemobile Estates in 2003, like that was home to us. Um, at that time, it was a two bedroom, two bath home. Um, over time, after having two kids, we added a, two, a third bedroom in 2017. So it was then a three, three bedroom, two bath. Um, but yes, that is where I did a lot of my community advocacy. I even taught English. I taught ESL in my living room where people paid me with like tamales or tostadas and food, okay? Because I never charged for my services. Um, but people wanted to pay me and I refused to take their money. So eventually they started bringing me food. I'm like, oh, they would ask me, what do you want? And I was like, no, nothing. It's fine. So then they would turn to my kids. Oh, mija, what do you like? What's your favorite food? My daughter would always say tamales. So they always brought tamales. And then my son was like, oh, how about enchiladas? So that's how my um, ESL classes at home um, got paid for with meals by our neighbors. Um, and that went on for a couple of years. And same thing, when I was PTA president, I did a lot of my volunteer work at home, like made translated forms, translated things for teachers. I did a lot of things from home because I couldn't legally work, but I was home with my kids. So um, I got to know a lot of my community because a lot of my community came to me when they needed forms translated, when they needed a letter read and translated for them, when they had letters from their teachers. Um, so, I mean, just recently, I ran into one of my neighbors who told me that they refer to me as La Bogada de Telemobile Estates, which is the lawyer of Telemobile Estates. I was like, really? That's what you guys called me? She's like, yeah, you were everybody's lawyer, <laughs> just because I translated forms for them. But, yes, but you were also trusted, though. And I really think that, especially when you're ser serving the Latino or Latinx community, I don't, I, I'll say whatever people want me to say, but um, trust. 
is incredibly important and they trusted you and you were, and they knew that you were effective and they knew that you were care, you, you cared about them and the outcome. So I just want to put in there that yes, all those things are true and you were trusted. Yeah. Yeah. I know that I was trusted because, um, when people, when the agencies that I had volunteered for in the past reached out to me, like wanting to pay for a hotel for me and my families, I would ask them, okay, can, um, can instead of, if you already allocated those funds for me because you know I'm undocumented, can you um, hold those funds and pay for another undocumented family? So then I reached out to families who I knew were undocumented and said, look, I have a, a certain person who's willing to pay for your hotel stay. However, they, um, they wanna make sure that it's an undocumented family because they know that you, we lack resources. We can't just go to FEMA and have hotels paid for, for us. So um, I did have a list of undocumented families who would reach out to me and say, hey, if you know someone who's willing to pay for a hotel, who, um, whose main goal or whose priority is to help undocumented families, then please add me to your list. So I did have a list of undocumented families who would reach out to me. And then I would reach out to different agencies and say, hey, I have a family of six, a family of four, can you pay for their hotel? And I did that for about two months and then funds kind of dwindled. Yes, as they do. And that's actually one of the reasons why we exist is because we're here for the long term. And, you know, most of the donations and the help comes in in the first six to eight weeks. And if you're lucky, maybe 12 months, but for the most part, that's not common. Um, but people really start to need the most help many months post disaster. Like they need, you know, things that will stabilize their future. Um, and most people don't understand, you know, that FEMA it won't help you. It's not that they don't care, but they're legally unable to help people who are undocumented. They, I was very, very pleased to hear Governor Kate Brown talk to the uh, Biden administration last week about how important it is to include undocumented people in our disaster relief efforts because, you know, Undocumented people pay into the tax system constantly, but they have no ability to extract from that system. And so it's a myth that somehow they just come, you know, that people just come here and somehow don't contribute, but then they're taking out of the system. And it's really the opposite is true. They're putting into a system they cannot access when it really matters. So can you talk about that experience of, of witnessing that and being an advocate and being this really critical emergent leader you were already a leader but you were an emergent disaster leader for ensuring that you know you could connect the resources where they were but really the long-term struggles for people who you know pay into a system that they cannot access yeah well with daca like i said i can legally work in the united states and i've been paying taxes i have all that fica thing paid i get all these deductions from my paycheck yet I can't apply for unemployment. I can't apply for emergency funds. I couldn't even apply for financial aid when I was going to college. And I was working full-time to go to college, yet I couldn't apply for that. So any aid that comes from the federal, any federal aid, we're not eligible for because legally we're not, we're not documented. Even my DACA card, um, which has, it's, it says employee authorization, right at the bottom, it says no legal status. So, I mean, yeah, I'm legally um, able to work, but I have no legal status, therefore I'm not eligible for any resources available by the federal government. Um, I did, um, I, it did take me five years to earn my bachelor's. And um, so along the way, I was able to get private insur private, um, private scholarships. Mm -hmm. So private scholarships can set up their own requirements. So I got a lot of private scholarships that helped me pay through my bachelor's. My first two years at my community college I paid for completely out of pocket working two jobs and going to school part time. Um, and then my third year was pretty much fully paid by scholarships. My fourth and fifth year I was able to transfer to Southern Oregon University where I got my bachelor's in psychology. Um, and at, so at RCC I got my bachelor's in um, human services which that, I felt that that was my calling like to serve people. That's not not human resources, but human services. People get those two confused. You know, human services is social work and that's what I wanted to get my degree in. And then at SOU, I just became fascinated with psychology. So I might, I majored in psychology there. Um, but yeah, I, a lot of this is a privilege that I've had because of my advocacy work. I was able to get private scholarships that didn't require US citizenship. 
And um, I know the struggle of what it is like to read between the lines. There's a lot of forms out there that say, oh, you, no legal status required. But the first question is, what's your social security number? Or no legal status required. I mean, people don't realize how many forms require a social security number. You go to the dentist, you go to the clinic, you go to even an eye doctor and they ask you for your social security or they even ask, are you a US citizen? You know, most families, especially after the disaster, I know many families who went to different agencies and tried to fill out a form. And as soon as they saw the question, are you a US citizen? They dropped the pen and walked out. Or if it asked, what's your social security number? They were done. They weren't gonna fill out that form anymore. Why? Because, because they are afraid that that information is going to be shared with the government and they're going to get deported. You know, families like myself, I'm, I'm going to be 37 years old this month, this, um, this year, and I've been here since I was four. My entire life is in the United States. Home is here. I know that there's that might sound like a cliche because that's what a lot of DACA people say, home is here, but this is home. Home is here. If I was to be deported to Mexico, I have nowhere to go to. Nowhere. My mom still lives in LA. So does my sister. My dad is, has never been part of the picture. So I don't have anything to go back to. And that's the well, story of so many of us. Well, and two things. I want to make sure that you talk about the difference between the reporting numbers of what's needed in the way for housing and how mixed status uh, families do not qualify. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so how those numbers are actually skewed in communities like yours and communities like mine that have a significant number of undocumented, um, maybe up to 27% of our population um, is undocumented and we, and very much pays into and contributes to everything that we, we do here. And in fact, we couldn't function in wine country if it were not for um, undocumented people. And that's something that maybe is an impolite thing to say, but it's absolutely true. So every time you're drinking that bottle of wine and then sitting there and, you know, if, they, if somebody in the audience is looking and saying, well, why don't they just become documented? Let's just answer that question now before we go into the issue of FEMA and housing. Like, so, so why is it that it is, you know, what's the, how, why is it that more people just don't simply become documented? Well, because the, um, I like to use this like movies. If you've ever seen a movie where a woman goes into labor and she gives birth like within five minutes because in movies things happen like that, that's kind of what immigration is like. Yeah. You know, if you're someone who has given birth, you know that you don't give birth in five minutes. Right. I mean, those are there are some extreme cases, but that is not the, the common. Yeah. I've given birth twice and not once that I give birth in five minutes once. So no, that doesn't happen. And it's the same thing in movies and movies. You see an American marry an, uh, someone from another country and in a couple of weeks, they got their green card and they moved to the United States. That's not how it works. I came to this country illegally. I, my mom came when I was four years old. She brought me and my sister. And because we crossed the border, border illegally, um, legally we cannot become legal residents until we leave the country for 10 years as a penalty for entering the country illegally. And I have no say in that. You know, when I was four years old, I didn't choose to come here. I'm grateful that my mom brought me here. You know, yes, I didn't get to choose it, but I'm grateful because this is home. This is where my life is. But at the same time, to be penalized for something that I had no say in is, is unrealistic. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, I met my husband when I was 17 years old. And he, again, he's a U.S. citizen. He's an immigrant, but he's a U.S. citizen. And when we were about 18 or 19, we went to see an immigration lawyer because he's a US citizen. So we thought it was gonna be an easy process. And he told us, no, you have to leave the country for 10 years, even if you're married to a US citizen because you'd entered the country illegally. Um, he can, my husband can apply for like a, um, a hardship permit type of thing, which he needs to prove that me leaving the country for 10 years would cause him extreme hardship. And they mean extreme hardship. He needs to prove that him not having me in the United States would be an extreme hardship. And at that time we thought, oh, well, this is doable. I, we can, we should apply. Um, so we were actually gonna start the process of me becoming a, a resident and he was gonna apply for that extreme hardship where um, if approved, then I don't have to leave the country for 10 years. But then we found out I was pregnant with my son. And then we were like, no, because if I'm not approved, I'm gonna be deported and our son's gonna be born in Mexico. So at that time we decided that it wasn't worth it. We were not gonna risk my son being born in Mexico so that was the end of us trying to be, for me to become a legal resident. And you know, that penalty still exists today. You know, if I wanted to become a US res resident tomorrow and we decided, okay, 
let's let's go for it. It's actually harder for him to prove extreme hardship when my kids are older. My son's 16, my daughter's 13. They're both independent. They're both, they don't need me to take care of them. You know, I'm employed full time, so is he. It, him proving extreme hardship is harder as my kids get older. It would have been easier when my kids were younger, but it becomes a harder thing to prove um, when the kids are older and especially like my lawyer's like, oh, is your husband an alcoholic? Does he have any diseases? Does he have anything that he depends on you to take care of them? I'm like, nope. They're like, what about your kids? Are they in juvenile detention? Do they have any problems? I'm like, no, actually they're really good. They're community leaders as well. And that's my lawyer, insane. Yes. So, I mean, that's, that's insane that you, that you, you know, uh, it's like, you're like to your kids, can you, can you go into the juvenile system and to your husband, do you mind becoming an alcohol? I mean, that is insane because you're doing everything right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I have to, we have to prove extreme hardship. My kids, it, they're not, my kids are community leaders just like me. So um, for us, we know that proving extreme hardship is going to be hard. So we can't, I can't apply to become a legal resident. Unless I'm willing so to. So with the, yeah, right. And to go where? To a place that you haven't seen since you were four, because the other side of our really dysfunctional immigration system is that the more people demand like closed, tightened borders, the less connection people actually have with the countries that they came from, because they can't go back often for decades and often never, because mm -hmm. you cannot just easily like, you know, move between the countries. So that's, we could, um, we could talk about that all day and I just want to acknowledge like I admire the fact that you are so out in front in uh, about your your status and that you're an advocate because the only way we can get to the place where this isn't um a very you know so dysfunctional is to have a lot of straight truth and honesty and advocacy and leadership and that is a brave um place to live and I just want to thank you for being in that brave place because it matters so, but when it comes to the dot undoc, you know, if you have a um, mixed status families, which is more common than not, so you have some people who have legal status and some don't, um, the, you know, when they want to go into FEMA trailers, for example, like if, if there's a big, new beautiful uh, FEMA trailer complex right next to Talent Mobile Estates that Tot just opened. Totem Pole Mobile Home Park. Yes, that's where. And um, and we toured it and we were there last month with Fannie Mae. And um, one of the conversations, though, that has to be had is, you know, who will be living here and who is not allowed to live here? And so, you know, you can contribute for 20, 30, 40 years to a community. And then if when it all comes apart, you know, due to a natural disaster, what happens to those families? What has happened right now to those families? Eight months, nine months later. Um, well, many families are living with their cousins, living with their in-laws, living with families um, in two bedroom apartments who are now living rooms are turned into extra bedrooms or garages are transformed into an extra family space. So they're doubled and tripled up in homes but what's their long-term prognosis with the loss of so much uh, workforce housing in your area? Are people leaving? Are they staying? Are they, what, what, do you, what are you seeing? Honestly, I think a lot of people are losing hope. I can, conversation about leaving and staying is not even there. It's more like this hopelessness. Um, yes, the one thing about mobile home parks is um, like the Almeida fire took down 18 mobile home parks. And these were our affordable housing. We're looking at mobile home parks where rent was anywhere, depending on which mobile home um, park, you're looking between $380 and $600 a month. At Talent Mobile Estates, we paid $495 a month for rent. I had lived there 17 years. When I first moved there, rent was $250. Today, in today's um, economy or today's world, you're not going to find anywhere to rent for $495 a month. We're looking at apartments that are two bedroom apartments for like $1,500. You're asking families who were paying $495 a month to come up with 12 to $1,500 a month for rent. It's unrealistic, especially when these are families who are mixed status or undocumented, who do not make minimum wage. They're getting paid maybe under the table, less than minimum wage. They're getting paid $5 an hour. They're getting paid 
by the day instead of by the hour. So, Chuck, Chuxana, here we are. We're about nine, 10 months post disaster. We're still in that first year, which is sort of like we call a fire, fire war, like the fog of war is really in that first year post disaster. And then it starts to really, um, you start to really feel how long and difficult and, but possible. That's why we show up. Um, it is to recover. We're also really interested though in how we can influence and affect policies and how we can do better at the re local, state and national level. You know, when we go talk to FEMA or HUD or um, any of the major agencies. And so I'd really like to hear from you, what's your message for the decision makers who uh, you know, are putting, are looking for better answers on how to deliver um, for all families post-disaster into every community? I think the requirement of legal citizenship or legal status shouldn't even be a factor when it's a big community um, disaster like we experience. Again, um, I think it's about 2,600 homes that were lost, 18 mobile home parks um, were lost, and 70% of those 2,400, 2,600 homes that were lost were mobile homes. These are families who were paying anywhere from 380 to about $600 of rent. These are families who were mixed status or fully undocumented who cannot compete with the current market of housing, the current market of space of, of rent. Um, one thing that was made it so difficult for us to find a home was the fact that the price um, of homes went ridiculously high. You know, if we would have looked into purchasing a house in August, just two weeks before the fire, we could have bought a house for anything, anywhere from 250 to, actually 220 to 250 thousand dollars. But pretty much the week after the fire, you couldn't find anything in that price range. We, um, our home was um, 305 thousand dollars, and we had to pay for all our closing costs, which was an additional eight thousand um, dollars. It became a bidding war. We pretty much were looking at houses and if it was on sale for 280, by the time we went to look at it, it already had four or five offers that were above asking price. Now, every house that we looked at sold for anywhere from 40 to 60,000 above asking price. And how is that legal? Like pretty much the housing market took advantage of, I mean, I understand supply and demand, but how is that legal? How can it's it actually happen? not legal. Um, for the record, if your if your governor declares a state of emergency and 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 institutes price gouging, and it's likely that she did, it's just that people who are likely to turn in other people for price gouging um, are likely to be people who are documented and not like desperate for a home and a place to land, and so that unfortunately you know, the other dysfunctions in the system regarding immigration status in particular feed into um, illegal activities such as price gouging. But my husband is a U.S. citizen and, you know, our home loan is under his name, not mine. Everything in our house is always his name. And that made things difficult as well because our mobile home and talent, it was under his name only. Our cars are under his name only. Everything is under his name only. So even purchasing this house, we had to figure out how it was going to work you know, if something happens to my husband, what's going to happen to this house? Because I'm not even on the title. I'm not on the loan because I'm not a U.S. citizen. I have DACA, but I couldn't be part of the loan. Um, so, like, it's just it's really hard when people think that us undocumented people are just taking advantage of everything. We can't take advantage of anything. The system ensures that the system is made sure we cannot. Um, they're making sure we contribute to everything, but they're making sure we cannot um, get any resources from them. So, but it uses to... often your hope and your dreams against you. You know, you have your desire to ensure that your children have a particular, um, you know, access to education and to live here in America. And you are, I mean, you're an American. You've been here since you were four, undocumented or not documented. In my eyes, you are an American, period. And I think that you know, your love of this country and your hope and your dreams are leveraged against you. And that's my personal soapbox. And I, uh, I would like to see that change very much. As we're closing out though today, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, I'd like to hear about how your kids are doing and about the cats. 
Well, my cats, believe it or not, the four that we left behind, which were Bonita, um, Ivy, Panchito, and Sleepers, all four of them survived the fire. Um, not one of them, were, they weren't even injured, not a burn whisker or paw, um, but it did take a while to get them. We, we were able to get Sleepers on four days after the fire. Um, my kids wanted to go see the house. I didn't. When I knew my house was gone, I had I had no reason to go back to. I had again followed a lot of people on Facebook, and I was very much involved in social media, so I knew that everything was gone. Seeing the images of Kellen, I knew there was nothing to go back to. But my daughter and my son said they wanted to go see it. My daughter was very adamant. She said that for her, she needed to see it. She needed to see her house gone for her to be able to move on. My son was like, I don't care. I just want to go see if I can find anything. <laughs> He's like, I want to see if I can find any of my items. Um, so we did. We went to the to where our house was and and it really sucked to see it because I knew that for me, I emotionally did not want to see it. You know, 17 years of me and my husband making sure my kids never had to move. That's what those ashes represent. Our desire for our kids to never have to move and travel and relocate as many times as me and him had to do. That stability that we fought for was gone. So I did not want to go back, but my daughter did. It was important for her to see it. So I put all my feelings aside and we went back. And the day we went back, we found one of our cats. <laughs> it took a while to catch her. She was so scared, but we caught her and we brought her um, we brought her with us and it took 54 days to trap all of our other missing cats, our three cats. Um, we went back two or three times a week to feed them, to leave water for them because we knew they were alive. We had seen them, but they were so scared. They did not want to be held. We could barely get about an arm's reach distance to them and they would just take off. We had a lot of people try to catch them and eventually they were caught and they were brought home to us. But it took 54 days to finally be reunited with their last cat. And now um, we're at such a point that we have a, our household of eight cats and two dogs. Um, one of our cats did pass away while we were living in the shelter. She was 17 years old and had some health issues. And I think the stress of the fire and relocating, and I think she sensed it too. She felt our fears and our, I, you know, I think that the fire pretty much made her health deteriorate faster and we had to put her down. And that was hard too, because that cat was our first, I call her our firstborn. You know, we brought her, we bought our house in April of 2003 and we adopted her from the shelter in May of 2003. So she was our first baby before our kids were born. She was home with us. Um, and when she passed away, we had nowhere to take her home to. There was no grieving. I mean, the grieving process was there, but it, it wasn't the same because we couldn't take her home. There was no home to take her to. We were still living at a shelter. Because you were there for months, right? Yeah, we were there for 101 days. Mm -hmm. Our two weeks turned into an extra two weeks and then another two weeks. And then they said, okay, you can stay here another month. And then 101 days later is how long it took us to find the house. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, uh, Joksana, I, you know, from the moment that I met you, and maybe it was three moments, and um, I, I thought it, that you were um, something special. And um, I really um, love this job because I feel like it puts me in contact with really extraordinary people. And um, I believe you are extraordinary. And I, I know that you're also entirely ordinary in this other way that, you know, you're a mom and you are a Girl Scout leader and you're a wife and you're a citizen of the world and you are doing your best um, every single day and giving back to your community. But um, I felt uh, really privileged to meet you and I'm really um, grateful that you would come on this podcast and share your really um, moving, honest and important uh, point of view. And I think it's really going to help and make a difference for the people who hear it, who aren't aware of, you know, you and all of the other challenges and the challenges of being a dreamer and an American who is undocumented. And I really want to thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been the podcast, Had a Disaster, and this episode has featured Joksana Corona, uh, now of Central Point, Oregon, formerly of Talent Mobile Estates. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.